forgiveness. Today, we're going to talk a little bit about disappointment. Have you ever been disappointed before? I've been to you like every Sunday. <laughs> I've been disappointed before. One of the worst things ever is, it's not one of the worst things ever, okay? I'm, I'm being sarcastic. But have you ever stepped in something wet with a sock? Drives me nuts. Every time Angel gets a bath, right, she gets out and her feet are wet and I'll walk through the hallway because the kids are being crazy and inevitably I will step in a wet footprint with my sock and I am so disappointed. How about when you go to the food pantry and some psychopath has left an empty box of cereal in the food pantry? Does anybody like that? It was actually me. I just didn't want to throw it away, so I put the empty box back, but it was there. I'm so disappointed because you really want cereal and it's empty. Maybe Pop-Tarts are your thing. There are a lot of things that can disappoint us. One of the biggest memories that I have in my childhood being disappointed is my senior year of football. Right? It was senior night, and on senior night, you get to be recognized. So your family comes, and you walk across the, the, uh, the field, and they say your name, and you stand in line with the seniors, and it's just a really cool night. Well, my dad was a Zanesville Blue Devil football player. It was something that was really important to us. He had passed away my freshman year, so four years later, here it is, it's senior night. And so there are a lot of emotions that are going um, through me at that time, and I'm waiting on my mom to get there. And so senior night is there, here I am standing on the football field, and everybody's family is there, and mine's not. I am, yeah, thank you. Thank you for feeling sympathy for me, right? <laughs> so looking back, you know, it's like, ah, not that big of a deal. But it's something that really stuck with me. So here I am standing in line, my number that I wore was number 36, and so I'm kind of like up closer towards the front. Well, now it gets to the point where they start announcing names for the players, and my family is nowhere to be found. And I am so angry, but I am so disappointed, and I'm so hurt. And they start to go through the names, and then it's my turn. Family is still not there. So disappointed. And I had a friend of mine said, do you want to walk across the field with us? And I said, no. I would rather not walk across the field at all. You know, because sometimes when you get disappointed, you choose to, to act in certain ways in anger. And then finally, here comes, you know, my family. They arrived late, but I was so humiliated. I was so angry. It helped because it kind of fueled how I played that night. But man, those, there are moments that we can look to, right? That was for me as a kid. But even as an adult, there are moments you look to where you get really disappointed. Well, when we look at Jesus praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, in Luke chapter 22, here he is praying to the Father, and around verses 40 through 41, it says that Jesus was there, and he was praying to the Father. He asked his disciples to come, and he says, would you just, would you just pray for an hour with me, that the hour of temptation would pass by? And here is Jesus praying intensely, and we saw this last week, and he is praying so hard, and he is so stressed, and he has so much anxiety that drops of blood begin to pour from his skin instead of sweat. And he cries out to the Father, and he asks the Father this, Father, will you let this cup pass from me? But not my will, but yours. Not my will be done, but yours. And you know what answer he got from the Father? Nothing. Silence. No answer, no response, left alone. And I think it is through God's silence that we really experience some of the worst disappointment with our relationship with God. I'd like to read a quote to you by John Stott. He had this to say. He said, the real sting of suffering is not the misfortune itself, nor even the pain or the injustice of it, but the apparent God forsakenness of it. Pain is endurable, but the seeming indifference of God is not. And you know, there are some times when we feel like we are alone, just like Jesus did in the garden. God wasn't answering. He is silent in the midst of our suffering. He is silent in the midst of our pain. And we cry out to God and we say, God, where are you? Have you ever asked God that question? Have you ever asked God why? Have you ever asked God, where are you? Why haven't you answered my prayers? Why is it that somebody gets healed or somebody gets a blessing or somebody's prayers are answered and yet here I am left to suffer? Well, the cross provides a really good story and a good background and some solid theological truth to answer this question, why God? Why do we feel forsaken by God at times? 
You know, when we look to the New Testament, when we look to the Old, we see God. He's this person that is supposed to be an ever-present loving father. He is always there. He's our rescuer. He's our redeemer. Um, the Bible says in Matthew 28, 18 through 20, that God promises that he will never leave us or forsake us. And we see and read throughout this scripture how we serve this God who is always there with us, right? And we feel his presence. And don't you feel that sometimes? I mean, especially when things are going well, you're like, man, God has really got my back. He's blessed me. I feel so grateful. I feel so good about myself. And the next thing we know, we enter into a period of trial and suffering, and we say, God, where are you? You ever felt like that before? C.S. Lewis put it like this when he lost his wife to cancer. He says, God shouts in our, um, in our victories. He shouts when things are going well, but when things are going bad, he is silent. And he said this, it's like a door has been slammed shut in my face. You know, many of you know that Angel and I lost our, my mother-in-law, her mother, Sherry. Sherry uh, Zacco had battled with depression since she was 20. She was clinically depressed. She had a brain tumor that she got surgery on, which caused a lot of different diseases. Acromegaly, only 2,500 people in the United States have it. It's basically this growth hormone that pumps throughout your body, and it changes the structure of your face. And because of the brain tumor, she got acromegaly, and because of acromegaly, she got fibromyalgia. I mean, she had a slew of things that were going Going on. And so later on towards the end of her life, when I met with, with Sherry, she unfortunately had to be admitted to the hospital, and she just could not help but feel that God had forsaken her, that he wasn't there, that the one who gives life had abandoned her, and that's, that's how she felt. And I think there was a combination of her clinical depression with her medication that she was taking that just created this absolute recipe for disaster. But there is nothing worse than feeling like there is a God and he's indifferent towards you, and he's abandoned you. And it ultimately, unfortunately, led Sherry to take her own life. And we were so devastated that here is this woman who has loved God and has served God and has been faithful all of her life, who sacrificed and is the most wonderful person you would ever meet in your entire life. Some of you actually get to meet her, uh, did get to meet her, and yet in the midst of her suffering, it felt like God was silent, and that's how she felt. Have you ever felt like that? Have you ever felt like God is silent in the midst of your suffering? Well, when we look to the Bible, we see Jesus, who feels like God is silent in the midst of his suffering. He's hanging out on the cross, and he asks one of the most important questions that has ever asked in history. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In Matthew chapter 27, I'd like to read, starting in verse 41. Here is Jesus hanging on the cross, as we talked about last week. His body is mangled. He's been beaten. He's been tortured. He's been whipped. Uh, he's had a crown of thorns pressed in his skull. I mean, it's absolute horrendous suffering. He couldn't even carry his own cross up the hill. And so finally, here he is to be crucified. He's hanging out on the cross, and his hands and his feet have been pierced through with large wooden spikes. And here he is suffering for our sin, taking our place, and he feels a great amount of despair. And while he's hanging on the cross, look, look at what happens. It says in verse 41 that in the same way, the chief priests also, along with the scribes and the elders, were mocking him, saying, he saved others. Can he not save himself? He is the king of Israel. Let him now come down from the cross, and we will believe him. He trusts in God, let God rescue him, if he delights in him. For he said, I am the son of God. And so here they are mocking Jesus. You saved all of these people. You healed, you healed all of these people. If you really are who you claim to be, save yourself. And so they're quoting Old Testament scripture to him. And they're blaspheming Jesus on the cross. And they're mocking him. You can't even save yourself. How are you really the son of God? And you know what the answer of God was on the cross? Silence, nothing, left alone, abandoned as he suffered for the sin of the world. And God didn't deliver him. God was silent. In fact, here Jesus is hanging on the cross for three hours, battling suffocation because that's how you died through crucifixion. And yet God still didn't rescue him and didn't answer. And then everything in one second goes black. 
and he hangs on the cross for another three hours, for six hours total. And in the midst of this utter, complete darkness, which is actually corresponds to Roman history, there are people who talk about this incredible darkness that overcame the land in 33 AD. And here is Jesus hanging on the cross, suffering, and he feels abandoned by God. You know, disappointment with God really ignites a lot in us. I think one of the things that disappointment in God ignites in us is it damages our trust receptors, so it creates a lack of trust. I don't know if you've ever had your trust broken before, but when your trust gets broken, it's really hard to push through trusting someone again. You have to rebuild that relationship. And sometimes we have these false expectations of God who he is, and what he wants for our lives. And when we meet God and he doesn't answer our prayer, or he lets us down, or he doesn't bring healing, or he doesn't save our loved one, we get disappointed because we think this is how God should operate. This is how God should work. And if he doesn't meet my expectations, God, you have let me down. And I don't know about you, but I have been let down by God through the expectations that I have had. And if I were completely honest, it has affected my prayer life. I mean, how can I possibly go to God who has been silent in some of my suffering, who hasn't answered my prayers, who has let terrible things happen to my family? How can I want to pursue a relationship with the one who wasn't there when he promised he would be? Do you see how damaging that false expectation could be? Do you see how damaging maybe that even false idol could be? We have these certain ideas about God, and when he doesn't meet those ideas, we get disappointed. And I think disappointment is natural. You know, when God didn't deliver Jesus on the cross, um, it, it's interesting because you look at the crowd, and I think one of the things that they expected was for Jesus to be the one who could save Israel. You see, the Israelites, they had this false expectation they thought Jesus was going to be a Messiah who would come and redeem and save Israel and would push Rome back in their place and would finally make Israel the capital of the world. He was going to have a white stallion. Everyone who followed the Messiah was going to have political and military power. And so one of the things that they decided to do, and I think this was actually a motivating factor for Judas, not only was he deceitful and cunning and trading uh, his friendship with Jesus for 30 pieces of silver, I think, Jesus wanted to, I think Judas wanted to force Jesus Jesus' hand on the kingdom. And so the way he did that was push him towards this death or this crucifixion. I mean, finally, Jesus is going to have to usher things in after all. And so they had this false idea. They were going to rule the world. And here is Jesus hanging on the cross, the promised one, the one who had done things that they had never seen before. And surely if he was going to do something, it would be now. And yet they're disappointed. And what did they do? They blasphemed him. They cursed him. They shouted at him. I mean, their disappointment not only led to damaged trust receptors, but their disappointment ignited anger. Have you ever been angry with God for something that he allowed to happen to you? I have. Have you ever been angry with God for something someone else has done? I mean, when we look at the evil in the world and we ask this question, God, why would you let something like this happen? And that's what they, his followers did on the cross. I can imagine the 12 disciples being angry with God. God, we expected one thing, and you let Jesus be crucified. This isn't what we want. This isn't what we expected. You know, the Bible says in Psalms 37, 4, that if you delight yourself in the Lord, he will give you the desires of your heart. And I think a lot of people misunderstand that passage of Scripture, and we want to read it like this. Delight yourself in the desires of your soul and ask the Lord to give them to you. And we get angry because we don't get what we want or what we think we should get. And we discover that when we meet God in our disappointment, our hidden idols become known. We get disappointed because of our false expectations, and that reveals where our idolizing of things really are. And there are a lot of things that we idolize in this culture. Have you ever been shattered because you lost a job? Have you ever been heartbroken because you couldn't pay your mortgage and it got repossessed? We idolize kids. We idolize sports. People do crazy things when their teams lose. You want to tell me that's not an idol in your life when you're willing to burn cars and buildings and do crazy stuff because your sports team has won or lost? That's, that doesn't make any sense. There are a lot of things that we put up on God's pedestal, and nothing reveals that more than through our disappointment. And that's the same thing for the disciples. They had a false expectation which revealed their idolatry, which was military power and political influence. And they were devastated. They ran. 
When opposition come and Jesus went to the cross, what did Peter do? He denied Jesus three times. He said, Jesus, I will die for you. And then he runs and he denies Jesus. What did the other disciples do? They ran. One guy had his clothes ripped off of him and he ran butt naked, right? That's how much he did not want to follow Jesus in that moment. So disappointed, he was willing to run naked rather than stand and fight for Jesus. And there are a lot of things that we do in our disappointment and through our anger. But at the end of the day, the cross is the answer. You know, I've made a lot of uh, mistakes in my life, especially in the ministry. Being a youth minister, a lot of young youth ministers are really stupid, in case you didn't know. (laughs) Thankfully, ours isn't. (laughs) Kyle is a wonderful guy. He's got a good head on his shoulders. He, I don't want him to make the same mistakes that I've made, and so I've been able to, like, warn him not to be stupid, and naturally, he isn't a stupid person anyways. He's very smart, uh, very knowledgeable, very wise, but uh, I made a lot of stupid mistakes, like, for instance, okay? Not that it's a big deal, but it probably is, because I would make it a big deal. I, let, I would let kids jump off the roof into bounce houses, off the roof of buildings. Yeah, that was really stupid. I let them shoot water balloons through water balloon launchers at each other. You realize how much damage that could cost if it hit you in the face or the eye? I did a lot of stupid stuff, okay? There was one sermon illustration where I let the youth group like kind of represent what spiritual bondage was, and it created this really bad situation with the parents. Thankfully, the kid wasn't, you know, injured or anything like that, but just to be safe, they were really worried as parents would be, so they went to the neurologist, everything checked out okay, and man, (laughs) yeah, it's bad, it was bad. Everything checked out okay, but man, they were angry with me. And man, did I receive the rebuke of my life. I can tell you that right now. I have never been more humbled in my entire life than I was in that moment. And in the moment, I was so hurt and so angry at God. I'm like, God, here I am serving you, and you let this kind of stuff happen to me? I didn't even do anything bad. I didn't even make the decision. And you let me be abused like this? Man, I really questioned whether or not I wanted to be in the ministry. It was really, really tough. So anyways, long story short, through that rebuke, Through that disappointment in God, it was God exposed my idols. And you know what it was? My own pride. That's the idol that was destroyed that day. And I still struggle with arrogance and pride today. But a big chip was taken off my shoulders through that experience. And after I came through it, I was actually thankful for it. Have you ever went through something difficult and in the moment it really, really stinks? But when you look back on it three months or three years down the road, you're like, I am thankful that God let me experience that suffering. Otherwise, I would still be ignorant. I would still be a very proud person. But when I talked with the parents, I thanked them for that situation. Now imagine having some youth minister who hurts your kids say, hey, I'm glad that this happened. <laughs> and they were really offended. I'm like, look, that's not what I mean. I'm not glad that your son suffered. I'm not glad that pain was inflicted to him. What I am glad is what the difficult situation produced. And that was awareness of my own self. And then I pointed to Isaiah chapter 53. This is a really powerful passage of scripture. It said, the Lord was pleased to crush him, being Jesus, putting him to grief. If he would render himself as a guilt offering, he will see his offspring. He will prolong his days, and the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. Isaiah looked forward to a day when God would send his suffering servant, and it would be pleasurable to God to crush his servant. It would be pleasing to God to cause him to suffer. And the question is why? Because it would prolong his days, and he would get to be with his children. His offspring would increase Here's what this means. It didn't please God. God's not sadistic. It didn't make him happy to allow his son to suffer on the cross. But God was pleased because of the result that it produced. Just like me with my mistake in my ministry, it destroyed my pride and it brought about an awareness in my life. And for Jesus on the cross, yes, it was painful, but it was pleasurable to God because of the outcome that happened and took place. And you know what that outcome is? You and me. And so through Jesus being forsaken on the cross, a bigger plan was at work. God's plan was at work. And through his disappointment and through his suffering on the cross, God was able to accomplish something that could not, been, could not have been accomplished. The salvation of our souls, the redemption of our souls. And I want you to think about your disappointments with God. And I want you to look back and say, God, even though I'm disappointed and I'm angry, How is it that you are working through this situation? Help me see, God, how you are working through this situation. That's the promise of the cross. 
You know, when we have disappointment with God, people ask this question, how do I deal with disappointment? How do we deal with disappointment when we lost Sherry the way that we did? How do we deal with disappointment when we lose our loved ones or we lose our jobs or our homes or our kids or something like that? How do we get a grip on this disappointment? And I think the one single answer is simply this, look to the cross. So here's the first way you deal with your disappointments. I think you need to convey them. You need to express your disappointments to God. It's okay. The cross is big enough to take it. You know, Jesus isn't the first one to express disappointment on the cross, believe it or not. For instance, Jeremiah, he said this to God, God, I am disappointed in you for what you let happen to Israel. I mean, isn't that about as real as it gets? I think it's okay to express disappointment to God. The psalmist writer, he talked about how, he says, God, you have taken me up and you have thrown me down. I mean, think about that imagery. Job, he lost everything other than his wife. He lost his kids in one day. He lost his house in one day. He lost all of his livestock, so all of his wealth was gone in one day. His body was struck with boils. He had terrible physical problems. His wife even said, look, Job, you've obviously done something wrong. You need to curse God and die. And you can go read all of this through the book of Job. I mean, the man lost everything, and he wrestled with God through his disappointment, and he conveyed his disappointment to God, and he asked the question, why? I'd like to read another quote to you by Philip Yancey. He, he wrote an incredible book on disappointment, if you want to read it. This is what he said. One bold message in the book of Job is that you can say anything to God. Throw at him your grief, your anger, your doubt, your bitterness, your betrayal, your disappointment. He can absorb them all. As often as not, spiritual giants in the Bible are shown contending with God. They prefer to go away limping like Jacob rather than to shut God out. And in this respect, the Bible prefigures a tenet of modern psychology. You can't deny your feelings or make them disappear. So you might as well express them. God can deal with every human response save one. He cannot abide with the response that I fall back on instinctively. And this is so true. An attempt to ignore him or to treat him as though he does not exist. That response never once occurred to Job. And if I were truthful, I would say that when I'm most disappointed with God, I am most distant. It's, it's instinctful. When you are hurt by somebody, especially God, you tend to withdraw. But that's the last thing that we should do. When Jacob was disappointed with God, he wrestled him and his hip was dislocated. When Job was disappointed with God, he went further towards God, asking him questions, expressing himself, conveying this idea, God, I am disappointed with you. And so I want to encourage you to do that. Maybe you're not disappointed with God, but the time will come. And one of the best things that you can do is go to the cross openly and honestly and tell God that you're disappointed in him and tell him why. You know, in Matthew chapter 27, we continue on in this story. They've blasphemed Jesus. They've said, look, you trust in God. Why don't you bring yourself up off that cross? Why don't you save yourself? And even the criminals who were next to him, look at what it says in verse 44. The robbers who had been crucified with him were also insulting him with the same words. Now from the sixth hour, darkness fell upon all the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that's Aramaic. That is in Greek, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus quotes Psalms chapter 22, which was a song. That's something that they sang. It wasn't just the word that they read. They would, they would sing it to a tune or to a beat. And here's Jesus hanging on the cross, and he cries out to God, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I think it was less of a question and more of a statement, if you know what I mean. Not really asking God why. I mean, Jesus knew why he was going to the cross. He knew what his mission was all about. But here he is bringing his disappointment to God. And you know what that does? That gives us the opportunity and freedom to bring our disappointments to God. God, why? Why, God, have you allowed this to happen? Why have you forsaken me? Why have you brought me to this point and this place in my life? Why have you allowed these things to happen? Jesus asking this question on the cross gives us the ability to ask the same question. And so convey your disappointment to God. It's the only way you're going to find true healing. You see, none of our wives will be excluded from his because all of our wives are healed through his. 
And so feel free to ask your questions to God. And when we ask our questions to God and we express our disappointment, the second thing that we can do is choose to trust in God. You know, Jesus felt and was forsaken by God on the cross because he died for our sins, but yet he still chose to trust in God. And the last words that Jesus said before he died on the cross in darkness was this, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. That was another psalm. And it was kind of like a a nighttime bedtime story. You know what we say, now I lay me down to sleep, I pray the Lord. You know what I'm saying? That that type of nursery rhyme. Um, I pray the Lord my soul to keep, and if I, you know, I I can't remember how it goes, but you guys know what I'm talking about. So, So that's exactly what it was. Jewish children would sing this, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And here's Jesus at the moment of being forsaken by God, feeling like God was not there, and yet he says, God, I trust you. I commit my spirit to you. Even though I'm not sure what's going on, I trust that you are at work and you are doing the right thing. Peter put it like this in 1 Peter 2.23. He entrusted himself to the one who judges justly. And so sometimes there'll be moments in your life where you will not know what God is doing, where you will be disappointed because you are angry at God and you have false expectations, but choose to trust in the Lord and say, God, I give you permission to let your will be at work. And I'm going to choose to trust in you, even though I don't feel like you're here, even though I feel forsaken, I know you're at work. Why? Because of the cross. I was reading about a mother and father They lost their son in a senseless accident. And this man was sharing the story in his book. Uh, He's a counselor. And she, of course, asked this question, why? You know, why would God let me lose my son, especially in this way? And she's expressing her disappointment and her doubt and her hurt. And this is what he said. He said, "When when I listened to her, all of a sudden, I understood that she was to us a witness of the sorrow of God. God is probably thinking the same thing. Do not think you are against God. He is beside you, speaking through you. Our heavenly father has also lost a child, and our cries of disappointment are welcome at the foot of the cross. We need to be willing to convey our disappointment to God. We need to be willing to choose to trust in God. And when we come to the cross, a beautiful exchange takes place. You know, sometimes we think if we, if we question or if we cry out to God, we're sinning and doing a bad thing and we should never question or wonder or ask God anything. We should just lock our feelings up, carry those chains in our pockets and just deal with it. And I think that's done so much damage to the church. We've got to be willing to convey our disappointment and choose to trust in God. But when we come to the cross, there's an incredible exchange that takes place. And here's what it is. We exchange our damaged trust for Jesus' determined faith. God looks at us, and we come to him through faith. God looks at us, and he doesn't see damaged trust. He doesn't look at us as worthless sinners. He looks at us through the perfection of his son. The Apostle Paul put it like this in Galatians 2. He says, I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. When you're willing to choose to trust in God, he will exchange his place with you, your damaged trust, for his complete trust, for his faithful trust, and he won't view you any different. That's the promise we have through the cross. So we need to convey our disappointment. We need to choose to trust in God. And thirdly, we need to confess our anger. We need to confess our anger. You and I were there at the foot of the cross, whether or not you believe that, whether or not you've ever recognized that. They cried out, crucify, crucify. They cried out, we want Barabbas, not Jesus. We want the criminal. Crucify this man. They were so angry. They foamed at the mouth. They insulted. And yet, in the midst of all of this anger, what were the words that Jesus cried out last week? Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Do you know how powerful that is? That means there is no amount of anger that you can bring to God that he's not willing to forgive you for. So instead of bottling it up and holding on to it and carrying around that weight of anger with you, confess it, own it, be willing to give it to the cross. There's a famous hymn that says, were you there when they crucified our Lord? And you know what the answer is? Yes. We've been angry with God sometimes, but you know what? The cross is big enough to take our anger. And so we convey our disappointment. 
We choose to trust in God. We decide to confess our anger to him. And we'll find that we meet love. And fourthly and finally, we need to confront our idols. You know what's amazing? Is that in one week, they went from singing, Hosanna, blessed be the one who comes in the name of the Lord. And they shouted that in the streets. One week later, they went from Hosanna to crucify. They went from blessings to cursings. Switched like that. People are fickle. I mean, they change really quickly. And that's the same thing that happened to Jesus. One of the worst things the nation of Israel and the disciples believed, as we said at the beginning of this message, is they had a false expectation of what Jesus was all about and what the kingdom was all about. And when their idol, when their idol was confronted, Peter denied Jesus, the disciples ran from Jesus, and everybody hid, and no one was willing to follow him through the end. They followed their instinct, which was to flee rather than fight for what they believed in. They became angry and disappointed. And you know, after the resurrection, which we'll get to talk about next week, really excited about Easter, it's going to be awesome. But after the resurrection, Jesus caught up with his disciples on the road to Damascus. And here's what they said in Luke 24. Let me read it to you. When they were talking with Jesus, Jesus says, hey, what's going on here? You know, why are you guys so upset? Here's what they said. We were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. They idolized military and political power. We were hoping something, and it didn't happen. And Jesus taught them, and he opened the scriptures with them. And Luke goes on to say this, Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. They saw him for who he truly was. When we are willing to confront our idols, and we give God permission to smash them and bring them down through whatever means necessary, we will be able to see God as he truly is. Not through our false expectations, not through idolizing things, but we will get a true nature on the kingdom and on Jesus, and we will live close to the cross. That's what 